Um, thank you. Um, he's had a really long 47-year career in baseball. Uh, began as a 17-year-old intern, I think, and um, had an improbable 19-year stint uh, uh, with the Orioles and rose to head of public relations and then witnessed and participated in the creation of uh, Oriole Park at Camden Yards, which is still one of the best parks in, uh, in the league, I, in my opinion. We went to a bar mitzvah there many years ago. It was terrific. <laughs> um, so they can do everything there. Um, and then uh, Charles followed Larry to the West Coast, and he was executive vice president of the Padres, the Red Sox, the Dodgers, then back to the Red Sox, um, all in addition to spending five years in the office of uh, Bud Selig, so as the commissioner. Um, he's also a dentist, and most importantly, he is the director of the School of uh, Com. Uh, sports com program. So we're so lucky at Emerson to have him with us. He's great with students. Um, he's one of the great recruiters for people to our program. And once they're there, finds jobs for them, takes them to the new Polar Park in Worcester that uh, just opened uh, last year that he was instrumental in bringing to Worcester. Uh, just a, a great friend of Emerson and a great uh, person for the uh, School of Communications and Sportscom in particular. So let's start, uh, Charles. Um, tell us the story of the of getting from the Pawtucket Red Sox, a, te a AAA team that has been in Pawtucket since 1977. Um, what happened there, how their deal fell apart, and how it got moved uh, to Worcester, and what your role was. Well, well, first of all, thank you for the kind words and that, uh, that glowing intro. Uh, what's the story? Now I know what they'll say at my funeral. It's, uh, I, I appreciate it. I'm available it. for that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, it has been an improbable time, and it's 47 years. Baltimore, San Diego, Boston, uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers, the commissioner, back to Boston. And then, of course, the next step on anyone's journey would be Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Of right, course. Well, the, the reason for that is that um, we had done all we had done in Boston. Uh, we had won, at that time, three World Series, saved Fenway Park, sold out every game. And uh, Larry Lucchino has been a mentor to me, even though I started in baseball before he did. Uh, I've been in it longer than he, but I was a perpetual intern. Uh, he came in at the top as um, uh, Vice President General Counsel. Uh, he worked here in Washington, D.C., uh, and his career uh, actually began because of the hotel where we are. Uh, it was um, uh, Watergate that gave him his first opportunity when he got out of law school. Uh, he worked um, with uh, another recent law grad, Hillary Rodham, uh, on the articles of impeachment of Richard Nixon uh, because of Watergate. <clears throat> and from that, he worked for uh, Edward Bennett Williams, legendary uh, trial attorney here in Washington, who later bought the Orioles. And that got Larry uh, into baseball. And w he had accomplished so much. But what he really loved was building ballparks in downtowns so that they transform cities. And so Pawtucket might not have seemed like the next rung on his ladder in a Hall of Fame resume, but a friend of his was a Rhode Island attorney uh, in Providence and said, Larry, let's buy the Paw Sox and we'll build a ballpark in Providence. There's a parcel of land. It's right on the water. You can build another Camden Yards. And that really appealed to Larry. And he said, they have really good Italian restaurants there. It'll be fun. So that's what he set out to do. But the road to Providence was perilous uh, because his friend who joined him uh, in this venture, new Rhode Island politics, which is a nation to study, uh, and, um, and knew how to get things done uh, in Providence. But sadly, three months after buying the team, his friend suddenly passed away. And Larry suddenly 
had the grief of losing a friend as well as the burden of having to navigate Rhode Island politics, uh, never having um, been educated in, in that school despite um, quite a substantial education. And the governor of Rhode Island, Gina Raimondo, who is somewhere up the street now in, in the cabinet, said there's no appetite in Rhode Island to build a new ballpark, a publicly funded or public-private partnership ballpark uh, in, uh, in Rhode Island, and certainly not in Providence. And so that was a dead end, but that's okay. We really came to like the mayor of Pawtucket, and we said, all right, Pawtucket's a nice, nice town that has old uh, American history bones. It's where the American Industrial Revolution started. And um, we crafted a deal, a 30-year agreement, announced on May 16, 2017, we are staying in Pawtucket, building a new ballpark that will revitalize this kind of old, scrappy textile town. And we're staying in Pawtucket. But, but, Pending legislature approval. It's only three words. Big three words, though. Word. So tell us how you how you moved then on to, to Worcester. We moved on to Worcester because that legislate that legislation that legislature approval never came. The politics in Rhode Island had the Speaker of the House fighting the governor. The governor. Uh, and the speaker both vying for the president of the Senate, and they didn't get it done. Larry said to them, look, if you don't get it done, I have to start returning phone calls. And they didn't get it done, and he returned the call to Worcester. There were 18 cities that wanted us. And the contrast, the, the whole story, is that the state government of Rhode Island would not get together to back their mayor in Pawtucket, in contrast to Massachusetts, where Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, worked seamlessly with the city of Worcester. And you can look at it from 20 angles. You can cynically believe that it was a money this or money that. That's not what happened. It was that you couldn't get the state to work with the city in one state and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts worked beautifully with Worcester, and Polar Park is a shining example, not of what Larry and Janet Marie Smith can do, it is that, but what you need to get things done, which is cooperation. By the way, Rhode Island, all the electeds were Democrat. In Massachusetts, Republican governor, Democratic mayor, didn't matter. They worked together and they got it done. Right. That's a big controversy now, too, is the funding of all these massive new arenas and stadium. Talk a little bit about uh, what you see as the future. There are some places, Buffalo, New York, for instance, uh, the governor agreed to fund $600 million of the new Buffalo Bills Stadium. The Pegula, uh, Pegulas, who own that team, put in only $350 million. Um, and other local governments are funding it too. How's that private partner uh, public financing going? Do you think it's gonna go in that direction? The A's can't get anything done in Oakland. What's the future? In every city, in every municipality, you've got to recognize that they're all the same in the following way. Each one's different. <laughs> Each city will tell you, we're not like this one. We're not like this one. And they're right. They're all the same that way. You use public funding if there are public benefits. You don't use public funding if there are only private benefits. So you've got to take a look at what are you building. Are you building a private home for a baseball team? Or are you building a year-round facility with public uses that make sense from a public policy standpoint. Someone who you might not have thought of would be for 
public funding spoke on our behalf when we were building the ballpark in San Diego, and that's George Will. Fiscally conservative, definitively. Major baseball fan. Though. Major baseball fan. Right. But here was his point. Do you build an airport with public funds? Yes. So that American Airlines and JetBlue will pay landing fees. You rent the space. He said you, it is the government's role to build infrastructure so that private business can do business. And by George Will saying that in conservative San Diego, that was a key reason that we won a 60-40 vote for public-private partnerships that got us Petco Park. So the future, to answer your question, is does a city have confidence that its venue will have sufficient public benefits to merit public participation. Talk about um, how the parks that you've been involved with, how the outreach to uh, local people, to diverse groups who live in the area, the towns, the cities where the park is located. I know in Worcester, I think there's a, uh, a big portrait, a big poster of Roberto Clemente inside that right. uh, par polo par mm -hmm. polar park. Um, yes. What's your, what's your uh, outreach like there? In every city, all the cities we've lived in, you have to know your city. You cannot close your eyes, build what you want to build, move a team that you want to move, and pretend that you're going to resonate. I'm born and raised in Baltimore. I know Baltimore and certainly knew Baltimore inside out. I knew every, every street, every neighborhood. You go to San Diego, what a lesson. You come to Boston, what a lesson. You move to LA, what a lesson. So in Worcester, you're getting to know a city that you don't know. That's the fun of it to me is we go into a place, we know no one, we know nothing, and we say, tell us about your city. And that's when they say, oh, we're unlike any other city. Oh, everyone says that. And they're all right. And so you learn about Worcester. Very, a very distinctive feel. And it is a city very proud that it has a history of embracing immigrant families and um, uh, heritages. Now, so did Baltimore. Except in Baltimore, the Jewish families lived here, and the Italians lived in Little Italy, and, and you know, it, was, it was kind of in coves. In Worcester, 120 years ago, they were noted for the immigrant families helping each other regardless of what nationality they were. So the Irish were helping the, the Jews, and the Jews were helping the Italians. And today, the Puerto Ricans, very prominent, are helping the Albanians. And the Albanians are helping the Ghanaians, major population from Ghana. The, you, the Ghanaians are, are helping the Dominicans. So you feel that, and you say, all right, I want to make sure my ballpark and my atmosphere are multicultural, not just because it's who we are, that's a great advantage, but that's who this city is. And you, we had 21 fan plan meetings all over town that garnered 877 ideas that are handwritten in one blue notebook, it's in my suite at Polar Park, and one was just a fan planning meeting for the, the families from Ghana. That was a couple years ago. Followed up yesterday morning with the key leader of the Ghanaian community, uh, his name is Maxwell. We said, look, who should we be making sure uh, gets to participate in what's called a taste of Worcester? It's a concession stand, but every home stand, it's a different restaurateur from the community that operates it. You tell us. We know who came from uh, the Hispanic community. We know who came uh, um, from um, 
the Thai community. But tell us, so you just continue to do the work, which is a pleasure, of reaching out and listening. It's the same as, you know, I know it strikes you funny that I'm a dentist, but, but I am. But the, it's funny to me. But listen to your patient. They will tell you what's wrong. Listen to the community. They will tell you what they want. And when you do what people ask you to do, they think you're a genius. Now, all we did was listen to you. You've also had success um, in the parks that you've developed um, helping the surrounding areas. Um, talk about that a little bit. How Even Fenway, it's not a brand new park, obviously, but you guys did an amazing job rehabilitating that field and that stadium, and that whole Fenway area now has just taken off like crazy. It's the key to your earlier question about whether it's worth it to invest in a ballpark. I was talking about the public uses of the ballpark, but you bring up what's really turned into the key. When we built Camden Yards, we built it in downtown Baltimore. Honestly, it was a bit of a, I won't call it a mirage, but you didn't see the second benefit, which was we were building it at the mouth of 95 and the BW Parkway. If any of you live in the DC area, you know that you can go up 95, go to the BW Parkway and get to Baltimore, but it was taking another 30, 40 minutes to navigate through Baltimore to go to um, Memorial Stadium. What we, so that's why we built it where we did. It was great for the mayor, but it was great to annex Washington, which we did. But we didn't know that bringing, we, we didn't know we were going to bring three and a half million people a year to a ballpark. That was beyond my expectations. But when you bring three and a half million people a year to a neighborhood, businesses want to be there. Businesses want to be where three and a half million people are. And so it sprouted and the whole area developed. We didn't plan that. That happened. So now we move out to San Diego and we see 26 blocks of languishing lots in downtown San Diego. Gorgeous weather, but nothing happening on the ground in this part. And we say, look, if you will do your portion, San Diego, of the financing, this area will come back. Well, we're a municipal government. We're not in the investment business. We are sure it will come back. Well, that's not what we do. They, they said, do you want to guarantee that it'll come back? Because we'll give you the development rights. And the majority owner of the club, John Moore, said, you bet. And so San Diego allowed John Moore's to be the master developer of a 26 block area. We built Petco Park, yes, three million people. And so the late Vin Scully was broadcasting a Dodgers game against the Padres several years later. And in his you know, inimitable way, but that I'll nonetheless try to imitate, he said, they are building condominiums here like they just invented the concept. So there's two parts to the development. There's commercial development, which you might think of in a downtown, but there's also residential development, and that's what really brings it back. We believed the rhetoric that we put out that said, if we build Petco Park, there will be $500 million in surrounding development. That number today, $6.5 billion. $6.5 billion in private investment because a catalyst for redevelopment was built that brings several million people down. So in, at Fenway, now you have a private ballpark, privately owned, you know, built in 1912, and when John Henry, Tom Warner, Larry Lucchino, and their partners bought the club in uh, uh, 2002, you're buying a private ballpark. All the improvements we had to pay for ourselves. And we didn't say we're staying forever. We said we're going to see how it goes. March 23rd of 2005, after our third year, we said 
we're staying. And that was the trigger. And the buildings have risen around Fenway Park. It's amazing. Yeah, it really is. What about the game of baseball? There are a lot of naysayers who say it's a slow game. Uh, the young children, you know, they play Little League, but they're not in it as much as they're into uh, football and esports and basketball. Um, the ratings are way under NFL, obviously. Um, what's, what's baseball's future, in your opinion? I don't know, and I worry about it. But there is an interesting thing that happens with baseball. The time of our childhoods, when baseball was the national story, when baseball's heroes were the nation's heroes, is I think what we're lamenting, what we're missing. But if you fly down to Houston tonight, Houston is hopping. If you have been in Philadelphia, Philadelphia is hopping. So somewhere that national resonance has dissipated from what we grew up seeing where the teacher rolled the TV into school to let you watch the World Series. But in the markets of the teams that make it to postseason, it is still phenomenally successful. TV ratings are actually extraordinary in local municipalities. If you're in St. Louis, you're watching a Cardinals game. If you're in Boston, you're, you're watching the Red Sox on Nesson, which is why we at the Worcester Red Sox are unusual. All of our games are on Nesson or Nesson Plus because you're showing the entire New England region what a good time people are having at the ballpark. So the question might be, why has baseball continued to succeed so well locally, and why has there been a change in its national resonance? I, I do believe that those who participated in the use of steroids wound up robbing baseball of an entire generation of heroes. And I, I don't think we've even fully grasped yet what a loss that was. You watch somebody have a great year, is that real? You know, that, that I worry about. One more question before we open it up to the audience questions. Um, and we'll take a different tact here. Um, you're director of uh, Sportscom at Emerson, uh, and you were really involved with your students and help, help them find uh, jobs and also recruit students into the program. Um, what do you look for in students who are coming in? What, what characteristics do they all seem to have? And what are the, uh, the job market, the employers telling you about Emerson students? Um, do they appreciate their work? Are they all go-getters? Are there some who they're disappointed with? What's, what's the, uh, what grade do they give Emerson? Before I tell you the grade, the answer to the question is one word. That's it, writing. Writing is the tree trunk. Everything else is a branch from that. The, I love teaching, and it was wonderful to get to meet uh, Greg Payne back in 2015, and he invited me to, um, I, I spoke, and then he invited me to teach, and I just adored it. But what moves me about it and what I tell the students is this, I have come from your future. It's like back to the future. I have come from your future to catch you now while you're still in school because I have hired thousands of people. You have hired yes. legendary people. And you had a journalism basis for it Okay. You didn't necessarily go for the camera aesthetics when they came into ESPN. Yeah. Well, they had to have some aesthetics, to some. be honest. Okay. But, yeah, but you're right. Journalism was always uh, very important in my hiring process. Yeah. Absolutely. And I watched that from afar, not knowing you and not knowing what you were doing. I'm like, really? Tim Kirkchen? Okay. He's gone. Yeah. 
fabulous journalist, wonderful guy. We'd worked very closely for a long time at the, at the Orioles. So the thing is, and maybe you may be better at this uh, than I in, in your career at ESPN, but I wish it were different, but when we give you the internship, we rarely tell the 150 others why they didn't get it. Well, it's very competitive, and this one, you don't usually go back to the ones who didn't get it and tell them, and I, I feel bad about that. And one guy spelled liaison wrong twice in his cover letter. That was an avoidable sin. But what you're telling me in your cover letter and resume is that this is my best work. And I can't give you a writing assignment when you work for me at the Boston Red Sox or the Los Angeles Dodgers or the Worcester Red Sox and not feel like I have to proofread what you do. Now, all of baseball history changed because of this. And how, this is how it happened. At the Orioles, we were moving to Camden Yards. And I am spending my time as the impromptu, unintended English teacher. Because Larry Lucchino is a grammarian. He's an attorney. Edward Bennett Williams was a grammarian. An attorney. They go together. You make your living on words. Well, I'm spending a lot of time proofreading memos because if Larry reads a memo from a college-ish age student and it's full of grammar, punctuation, or spelling materials, or uh, spelling errors, you're going to be diminished in his eyes even if you have great ideas. So I'm spending a lot of time. Well, I get a letter with a resume and it's well written. And well written letters jump out at you. And the resume is good. And I liked that this student was already writing for his college paper as a freshman. He was only a freshman. And he wasn't from Baltimore, so I wasn't sure he'd want to come. I called him up. He lived in Massachusetts. I said, you want an internship with the Orioles? He said, yeah. So he flies down on his spring break, and his oral communication was as strong as his written communication. And he brought his portfolio of articles, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, he can write. And my thought was, I won't have to proofread his work. In fact, he can help me proofread others. And that was my judgment. That's the reason I hired Theo Epstein as an 18-year-old intern. That's true. And he's telling me at 18, 19, and 20 at the Orioles, his dream is to be general manager of the Boston Red Sox. We're like, where's the Please come board? back, Theo, please. Well, we, you know, think of it. We're at the Orioles. We haven't even thought yet that we're moving to San Diego, much less knowing that we're going to Boston. So it's a, a stunning story of dreams coming true. But that's the core. That's the key. And so with the Emerson students, the ones I rave about are the ones whose essays, and I'm, you know, noted or notorious, you know, for requiring these papers to be written, are the ones that I can say, look at this, look at this. And the thinking that I see in the Emerson students, outstanding. The ideas, love. The percolation, the, 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 the energy is just great. The sports of soft power class, oh my god. It's, it's vibrant. And they have to have that fundamental of writing. In our organizations, and now it's a lot of organizations we've been with, the top people in the organizations go right through all those ball clubs are all competent or excellent writers. Excellent. I want. So we need to tell that guy or the woman, whoever it was, who misspelled liaison, that there's this new thing. It's called autocorrect. <laughs> look at your, look at your phone's predictive uh, uh, software. But you better know what you're doing because there's grammar of this and there's auto. You you have to know there versus there versus there. Right. Um, 
yeah. we want to see that attention to detail. Uh, the irony, the irony of that little story, the postscript. Theo knew that guy and said, no, I think we should hire him anyway. I said, oh, okay. Theo, it's going to cost you. He's not, ah, nah, nah, he'll be all right. He lasted a little while. All right, let's open long. it up for questions uh, for Dr. Charles, or, or if you have any for me, too, that's fine. Yes. All right, so um, I'm not a baseball fan. I haven't been one since I was, like, nine years old. But I'm uh, wondering, um, Dr. Steinberg, what do you think is could be a um, way to develop baseball more, to make it more popular, to maybe market it to more people to get it uh, more more viewers or do you think it's just it's reached its ceiling and you know the people that are watching the MLB right now is like as many people as you know they're gonna get why did we lose you when you were nine years old well I started watching the NFL and I was like this is so much better there's only like you know games one main day a week, Sunday, and then you have, you know, Monday and Thursday, obviously. But baseball, it's like, it's too hard to keep up. And there's too many games. And it's like, it's, it's too hard to follow. So yeah. Interesting answer. Because the only way we're going to know, we're not going to be um, staring in, in a crystal ball, is to really learn why you lose the people you lose. And there has been a dramatic change in the availability of baseball. Now, this myth that football was so precious because it was just Sundays, then just Sunday and Monday, then just Sunday, Monday, Thursday, then just Sunday, they got they got seven days of the week. They, they, they got the whole thing going. But they, they give you that impression. And yes, one of the things you're Mm, I won't say criticizing, but noting about baseball is its dailiness. You talk to a lot of people, that is what they love about it. The reliability, the rhythmic nature of it. I know that I can look forward to this every single day of the spring and the summer and into the fall. So there's a pendulum of, of attitude with that. But that which is a liability is also one of its benefits. But I think it didn't the other, have to lose you, though. The other thing is um, there, baseball is doing things to speed up the game. A lot of people's complaint about it is that it's so slow. But next year, uh, there's a pitch count. The games, hopefully, will be shorter. Uh, we'll see how all that plays out. But they are addressing it in some ways that doesn't totally ruin the game, but does help speed it up a little bit. Two things on that. They're much faster at AAA now. We used, we used the pitch clock, and the games were about 15, 20 minutes uh, uh, faster. Uh, the other thing is, you might see the evolution of games within the game. Now, I worry that some of that may have a dollar sign, uh, that there may be uh, the introduction of gambling uh, you know, in, in, on TV or in the stands. I worry about that. But I was trying it out. I went to the minor league uh, championship games in Las Vegas with my friend, with uh, Jack Verducci. That's Tom Verducci's nephew, is uh, the head of our corporate partnerships. And we're, we're trying to see what will grip us in a game we don't really care about. It's Reno versus the other team. Uh, maybe that might have been Reno. Well, I don't know who it was. It's OK. Why are we paying attention? I said, all right, Jack, I will proverbially bet you that this pitcher throws 20 pitches or less this inning. You take the over. Well, we suddenly had another dimension of watching the game. And here's a foul ball. Like, oh, stop fouling it off. Put the ball in play. He's like, no, 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 foul it off. So we're two kids. We're both 10 years old last month um, sitting there watching this watching it through a new lens, but every pitch mattered instead of only the balls in play matter. So there might be other ways to engage children and adults who are so used to everything being instantly transactional on, on their phone. There may be a way 
to make the pitch matter. And for us, it gave us a fun way to watch a game we were not otherwise invested in. Yes, in the back. to Bill Veek and also to Savannah Bananas, um, and I'll let you try to explain, you can do a better job than I can, I'm sure about both of those. Is there a way to learn from them and bring those elements into the major league games without bastardizing major league in terms of making it more relate, relatable to people and faster paced to keep up with video games and esports and also cell phones and all the rapid technology we have now? I think that a problem with major league baseball in general, which I'm fine with this issue, but in general, the game is too slow paced in the rapid paced world we live in today. So again, Savannah Bananas, Bill V going back words in present day, are there ways to bring those elements into the game in a positive way without ruining the tradition history and the sport itself? Thank you. I think it's a great question that has a partial answer. And that's going to be, to what degree does baseball have to be fast to conform? But let me ask you this. How many of you 18 years ago paid attention to the World Series when the Boston Red Sox were trying to break a curse, proverbial curse, for the first time in 86 years. <laughs> now you're not telling me about how fast those games went. Because in that case, you had some kind of gripping storyline. There was some kind of drama that took a hold of you. And you can say that it was the 86 years, Anybody know who won the 2005 World Series the next year? White Sox. How long have they waited? Longer. And nobody cared. It wasn't the Cubs. So it was the strangest thing. What makes a storyline? And I think if we can have an environment that makes storylines more fertile, then it may not just be the transformation of the speed of the game, but the development of the drama that has you captivated. Uh, people say things have to go like that. Um, how many of you watch any of the popular TV series that you stream now? And you watch them one after another after another. Wait a minute, you sit there and watch. You'll still watch a two hour movie. You do sit still and watch something. So I'm not sure that everyone is addicted to instant gratification. That may be part. But I think we should also look for the restoration of compelling storylines. I really haven't watched baseball in many, many, many years. Um, but are women coming into the league in terms of umpiring or so? Uh, One, wonderful question. And I'm going to ask you as my follow-up, why did we lose you in baseball? But yes, uh, the role of women and the future of women, I think, is one of baseball's uh, brightest stars. Um, I have believed for a long time you're going to see a woman play Major League Baseball. I said, I don't know, 10 years ago that it would happen within 20 years. I'll stick with that and say it'll happen within 10. Uh, women are playing baseball. They're playing hardball. They are playing well. They're going to fantasy camps. And there are barriers being broken by pa pioneers right now. There was a Major League Baseball player named, uh, I think, John Hudek. You don't remember him. That's OK. I think he played with Houston. Well, his daughter playing NCAA, what you would call men's baseball. The Red Sox went to Japan in 2008. A 16-year-old girl sees what Tim Wakefield is doing. She starts working on a knuckleball. She came to the United States, and she played independent league, the highest level you can go before getting into organized baseball. You're going to see women play baseball. What I didn't anticipate is who has passed the ball, the ball players among women? The coaches and the managers. I sat for a game this year in Worcester with a Boston Red Sox coach. 
she was coaching one of our top prospects, six foot five inch big burly guy named Tristan Casas, who's supposed to be our next big thing. Well, she had been his coach and was working with him on, on his shows and she, she had command. The New York Yankees, much as we who are with the Red Sox may loathe mentioning them, yeah, I, I give them full credit. They have a manager of one of their minor league teams who is a woman, first one. So that's happening. Umpires, yes, Perry Barber, she's, you know, they, these are the pioneers. And in the ascent of women in uniform on the field, these are the pioneers we're going to look back on later. Now, in the front office, it's been going on for a long time. Uh, Janet Marie Smith will go in the Hall of Fame. Uh, she is the um, exceptionally brilliant um, ballpark designer who partnered with Larry Lucchino on Camden Yards. Uh, did a little bit with us at, on Petco Park, but was primarily working with Ted Turner in Atlanta. Then reunited with Larry to save Fenway. Now she's just done a magnificent job with Dodger Stadium, um, but her genius is not limited at all to design. It will not surprise me if she is a Major League Baseball CEO, will not surprise me if she's part of an ownership group, and I could see that happening 45 miles away from here. I could see that. She's never stopped living in Baltimore. So the women Women are leaders at every level of our organization. Our executive vice president, general counsel, Harvard Law grad, uh, our senior vice president, assistant general manager, all, all throughout the business side. Uh, when I was at the Dodgers, president of the club was a woman. So on the business side, if there are still vestiges of a glass ceiling, they are becoming, I think, fewer and fewer. But the enlightened clubs, it's wide open. And then I'll so same, same thing to NFL and NBA, women referees yeah. um, and, and coaches, and it's, uh, it's changing. It's slow, but it's changing. But Any it, other it's, question? It's happening. I am a baseball fan, so I feel like we needed to have one person to say okay. that they're a baseball fan. I am in Atlanta, so I'm a Braves fan. Go Braves. <laughs> but um, I see baseball still as very attached to nostalgia and to the sense of nostalgia and to um, the family dynamic. But I also think that, you know, I see it, we were talking earlier, like it's dependent on the imports of a lot of Caribbean and Latin American players. Um, it's changed the game, it's changed the face of the game. Um, and I see the use of social media now a lot with these clubs to be able to include more communities and include more people who maybe didn't grow up with that nostalgia of baseball. How important has social media been to you guys and how have you been able to still maintain the traditions that bring the traditional fans to the baseball stadium? You know Xander Bogarts, the Boston Red Sox shortstop? Anybody know what uniform number he wears? Two. Why? Derek Jeter, because oh, right. yeah. he grew up in Aruba, right. and he would watch ESPN. That's what he could see. And he often saw the Yankees, and he saw Derek Jeter, and that's who he wanted to emulate. He comes up as a rookie, gets number 72. I visit him in Aruba that winter. I said, you got changed from 72, right? He goes, yeah. I said, what are you going to pick? He goes, uh, I'm going to pick two. And we just had Jacoby Ellsbury wear that, and then he left us to go to the Yankees. So, ooh. Oh, Ellsbury said, is it okay to do it? I said, yeah, why? I said, well, Derek Jeter is how I learned to love what baseball looks like. You know, I would play. So when I worked for Commissioner Seelig, who is a surprisingly hilarious guy, did not show that to the public. And oh my God, did we, is he, does he have humor? But in serious moments, he would say, we're facing these challenges in the United States, while around the world, baseball's popularity is soaring. Baseball's enormously popular in Japan, in Korea, in Taiwan, 
throughout the Caribbean. Baseball's huge in Cuba, in Aruba, in the Dominican, uh, um, still in the United States. Let's make not let us think Puerto Rico's not. Puerto Rico, uh, baseball's huge there. In Holland, um, and it's gonna grow more in Europe. So there's somewhat of a, kind of a sporting, sparring thing we have going on in the United States about baseball, but not as a game that kids love to play. That is happening. You go to the villages in the Dominican, and we, we started a program called Lindo Sueños where we go to these villages. The five-year-olds are loving baseball. Now, one thing about baseball internationally, the players and the ballparks are very full of life, of dance, of self-expression, of music while the game is going on, live music, you know, baseball, tends, in America, has tended closer to golf. Shh, they're playing. Well, I'm not so sure that's where the future is. Let the players enjoy self-expression and a bit of a fuddy-duddy nostalgia may go out the window. It's very popular. That, it's funny, we should be able to import that from America's great export, baseball, we should be able to import the fun that's going on all over the world. And uh, one more question, if we have one. Yes. Hi, my name is Mark. I come from Barcelona. I work for Blancarna. We started a sport management, management program six years ago. And one of our biggest concerns is uh, what should we teach our students in order to get to be uh, the best sport managers. So I would like to know your opinion as an expert, as an expert of this. Uh, what would you think that are the probably three main competencies, three main things we should teach them? If Thanks. the number one thing is writing, English, the second thing we look for are people who are bilingual, bicultural, biliterate. Because if we can have someone who has those skills or qualities in Spanish, in Japanese, in Korean, now we have catalysts to foster the popularity of our game on social media all over the world. Now our players have someone uh, that they can talk to in the front office. Yes, there is more uh, multilingual, um, there are more multilingual skills on the coaching staff these days. But when you can have that in the front office, we want that, we're looking for that. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day and they were talking about someone who is trilingual, tricultural, uh, tri triliterate. Uh, they're like Hispanic, Japanese and fluent in Spanish and Japanese and love baseball, I'm like, you're, you're in great shape. You know, make sure you can write the English, but you're, you're getting hired because you're not a twofer, you're a threefer. And we want that social media resonance all over the world. That's the beauty of social media, or one of the beauties of it, or one of the aspects of it that is beautiful. I'm not saying all of it's great, but if we can connect, what is the geographic limitation of your ball club? For Worcester, is it Worcester County? No, you grew up learning about the Toledo Mud Hens because Corporal Klinger talked about it on MASH. You may have, well, you've heard of the Savannah Bananas, why? Why have they broken out of the Savannah geography. There's actually no limitation to where your popularity can go. And you've got a market that is not New England, not that that's a bad market, it's a good one, but it's seven and a half billion people. Tell me, what kind of person in the entire world is incapable of falling in love with baseball? So I'll take the multilingual student um, because they are in short supply, high demand, and their value, it, they are right on time. The, look, the future of social media, we're still in the what, second, third inning of it maybe? 
maybe first inning. It's all storytelling. It's storytelling in 140 characters, 280 characters, storytelling in one visual image, storytelling in 30 for 30, storytelling in Ken Burns' miniseries. It's all storytelling. Those storylines from the 2004 Red Sox, from the 2016 Cubs, those are cool stories. That's not nostalgia, that, that's current events. The social and cultural history of New England has changed. The concept of ballparks and cities has changed. We've got some good stories to tell. They should be told in every language, in every country, everywhere in the world, because while well, I'll finish as I started, all these cities say, we're different from every other. Exactly, which is why they're all the same. But people are people. There's nothing different about an eight-year-old in the Dominican from an eight-year-old in Worcester. They've got dreams, they, they idolize, and if you can recognize the beautiful humanity that we have in the world and reach out to people on their terms, on their turf, in their language, celebrating their cultures, you may show them how baseball was not only the great change in America through Jackie Robinson and through the future Jacqueline Robinson and through Roberto Clemente and through David Ortiz and Pedro Martinez and go you know, all over, all over the world, but that's still baseball's greatest gift. It brings everyone together within a community and throughout the world. Dr. Charles Steinberg, everybody. Excellent.